Yeah, so hello everybody. Welcome back to the second session of Seaburn Division's talk. So good afternoon, I'm Nellie Bien. I'm a biologist and project officer in the Chemical Medical Countermeasures Branch in the Seaburn Division at BARDA. So as you've been hearing earlier today, BARDA's mission is to develop medical countermeasures to address public health emergencies. But what does chemical defense have to do with public health and public safety? Why are we interested in chemical defense? Well, the reality is that chemical incidents do happen. They happen to this little girl in the photo here, her family around her. They happen to civilians, not just individual political targets. And they've happened recently. So chemical incidents can include chemical accidents, like industrial accidents, and also chemical attacks that are intentional. So this world map here shows intentional use of chemicals since World War I. And the red circles denote recent chemical incidents of intentional use since 2013. This includes the use of multiple chemicals during the Syrian Civil War, also the assassination of King Jom Nam using nerve agent and Novichuk in 2017, and the UK, the Salisbury poisonings in 2018, a year later. And just a couple of years ago, there was attempted assassination of Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny. So chemical incidents are real, I just named uh, intentional use of chemical weapons. This map doesn't even include, you know, large-scale industrial accidents that have happened recently. So you can see some areas where intentional use overlap with public health and safety. One good example is the 2002 Moscow uh, hostage crisis where synthetic opioids were used. Well, Back at home, you're all familiar with the opioid crisis, which is worsening. There's been increasing deaths due to synthetic opioids, mainly fentanyl. And now it's said that we're in a fourth phase of the opioid crisis, which is the combination of synthetic opioids like fentanyl with other drugs, either through accidental use or contamination. So these are some of the compelling reasons why we're interested in chemical defense. So our mission in the chemical MCM program is to improve the health outcome for all victims of chemical exposure, no matter how they were exposed, whether it was an accident or some in intentional use. So there are many challenges for addressing chemical incidents. So one of the main challenges is the sheer number of chemicals that can cause harm. So the Department of Homeland Security has 200 chemicals in their threat list. And how do we address 200 chemicals? Well, it's not practical, obviously, to develop antidotes and have a solution for all 200 threat agents. So chemical um, exposure is fast acting. You only have minutes to hours to treat the victim. Diagnostics, even if we had 200 of them, they wouldn't be fast enough for helping and making medical decisions. So the CHEM MCM program strategy is to treat the injury, not the agent. And to do this, we are interested in the five priority toxidrums that are already used in emergency medicine, and they're listed here. So what's important about these five toxidrums is that you can see that these toxidrums are involved in normal disease processes. So since there is a hospital or disease indication that may treat these toxidrums, we think that these medications can be used also to treat chemical indications. So this le leads to our threat agnostic strategy, 
We're not in, interested in the chemical itself initially. We're interested in treating the injury and the symptoms. And because of the overlap of disease symptoms and injuries with chemical symptoms and injuries, we think that we can uh, use the multipurpose drug strategy. So that's the background between the Chem MCM program's three priority objectives. It's the first one, the, which I just mentioned, the multipurpose use of drugs to treat a common indication between a disease state and a chemical um, injury. This leads to our second objective, repurposing drugs. So repurposing common drugs for chemical indications that already have a disease indication. So what do I mean by this? Well, you know, I'm preaching to the choir that drug development timelines are so long. But that's not the main reason that we're interested in repurposing drugs. We actually think that having these drugs closer to the end user at the hospital or in the ambulances will be to our advantage. As it was mentioned this morning, we can produce drugs, treatments, diagnostics that we think will be useful. But if they're not there with the end user and the end user doesn't know about them or doesn't want them, then they won't be ever used. So that brings us to the third objective, getting the end user involved. And so we want to improve end user engagement so we can develop the medical countermeasures that first responders would want to use. So I touched on the first big challenge, the 200 chemical agents on the Department of Homeland Security threat assessment list. Obviously, there's more than 200 chemicals that can cause harm. Also, chemical exposure, as I mentioned, is really fast acting. Um, also, chemical incidents are local. So centralized stockpiling might not be sufficient for treating chemical injuries. Also, diagnostics even if we had 200 diagnostics that were specific to each chemical, they would not be uh, fast enough for um, aiding in treatment. And as uh, was mentioned this morning, there are changing requirements. So the landscape of terrorism or public health crises, such as the opioid crises, may change, and there's changing priorities. But we believe that if we stick to our strategies, the three objectives, treat the injury, not the agent, then we are capable of addressing chemical injury successfully. So I touched on the five major toxidromes. So this slide gives more details on the chemicals underlying the toxidrome. So I just want to point out here that some chemicals are um, involved in multiple toxidromes, such as vesicants like sulfur mustard that can cause injury to the skin, eyes, and lungs. Also want to point out that the, some of the incapacitating agents on this list, such as the benzodiazepines and fentanyl, are not only inca incapacitating to the brain, but they cause death by respiratory depression. So we've had seen success in our treat the injury approach. So one of our successes is the FDA approval of Cezolam. Cezolam is midazolam, but the indication isn't for nerve agent or chemical-induced seizures. It's actually for status epilepticus or seizures, no matter what caused the seizure. So, so far, I've talked about our objectives, but how are we gonna get there? So here's our three major drug development strategies. So first, we have to identify the candidates, and this is through screening, um, well, this is through pathway ident identification by finding common mechanisms between the disease state and the chemical. Um, and then, 
we will screen the candidates using organ chips or internal BARDA mechanisms, such as the non-clinical network um, capabilities and the BARDA redirect easy BAA, which I'll talk about more later. We also provide program support for primary clinical indications for label changes, or if there's no clinical indication yet, we would uh, support co-development. And so this is an incentive program for label expansion. So the chemical MCM priorities for FY23 are listed here. Really want to focus on how important delivery is. So we want to have delivery and administration that um, supports mass casualty events. So what's practical? IV is not practical in the field. Probably I am. Sub-Q, subcutaneous delivery is more practical. As I've been emphasizing, hopefully, through this talk, we are focused on repurposing drugs. Our current threat priorities are listed in the third column. However, through gap analysis, we've defined our priorities as chlorine-induced lung injury, opioid-induced respiratory depression, and these are mechanisms that don't go through the opioid receptor antagonist pathway. Next, sulfur mustard, ocular and inhalational injuries, and refractory seizures. So I put a lot of emphasis on repurposing drugs. So what are the mechanisms how you can uh, join the CHEM-MCM program? So we have two major mechanisms for repurposing. One is for early stage. This is the BARDA redirect um, program through DRIVE. And so this is for early stage proof of concept studies to prepare you to be eligible for the BARDA BA program. Our late stage repurposing program is called RepoChem. And this is the label expansion that I was talking about earlier. So, I'm going to put our chem plug here. Tomorrow at 1 p.m., there's our repurposing breakout session. So if you want more details on redirect and repo chem, please join us tomorrow. I want to close by going over our current portfolio by threat. So I'm not going to go through the whole list, but just want to point out that you'll see that these are small biotech companies, academia, and large pharma and they cover our portfolio priorities. These include our redirect partners, too. And we want to thank these companies for their partnership in supporting the ChemMCM and VARDIS missions. Lastly, I want to thank all the SMEs and the ChemMCM branch and contracting for all their support on our projects, and our fearless leader, Judy Laney, branch chief. If you have any questions for us, please email Judy Laney or Contact any of us through the bid platform, and please join us at our repurposing session tomorrow. Thank you. Uh, next up is uh, Kimber Kimberly Hoffmeyer from the uh, Rad Newton uh, branch of CBRN. Thank you. Okay, so thank you, Deli. And, you know, Chem always raises some really thought provoking <laughs> points. And for the BARDA Radiological and Nuclear Countermeasures Branch, what we're always really thinking about is with our current systems and resources, are we prepared for the medical consequences of nuclear detonation? And are we prepared to respond and treat literally hundreds of thousands of casualties? And then how can we build our radiological and nuclear preparedness to be able to actually say yes and respond to this? Um, and given the importance of partnerships that are that's highlighted in the BARDA strategic plan, how can you, our current and future partners, help us to do this? So to frame this, we're thinking about radiological and nuclear threats across this full landscape. The big one, of course, being nuclear detonation. This is the mass casualty incident. But we're also thinking about radiological dispersal devices, which are known as dirty bombs, and these use conventional explosives to disperse radiological material. And also, given the current geopolitical climate, 
nuclear power plant incidents. Um, this, so the highest impact of these threats is, of course, nuclear detonation, um, which is what we focus on for setting our requirements and use as a consensus scenario for developing and planning for radiological and nuclear preparedness. And so while we're always, of course, hoping for the best, we are planning towards this worst case scenario with the intention that we would be ready for anything in between. But given the threat of nation-sponsored events, we're preparing for a detonation approximately the size that occurred in Hiroshima. This is a 10 kiloton detonation, and our scenario thinks about detonation in two major metropolitan areas. And the outcomes of a nuclear detonation, the blast, the radiation, and the heat, are gonna, again, result in hundreds of thousands of casualties with complex injuries. This includes blast trauma, radiation injury, also burn injury, and also combinations of these injuries that have a worse prognosis than either injury type alone. So the red new branch is focused on the threats that are indicated in red here. So this is radiation injury, but also blast injury. And we're thinking about a real specific element of blast injury, and that is the systemic effects of blast injury. Um, and in a bit, you'll hear from my colleague, Vlado, the burn blast branch. They're also uh, working towards developing countermeasures for blast injury, but from a somewhat different and complementary perspective. And Vlado will get into that so you can kind of understand and see the differences between um, our branches. But so in addition to these mass casualties, nuclear detonation will result in infrastructure damage that will add strain to resources that we're already going to be strained just by the sheer number of casualties alone. So with that in mind, it's really important for us to provide care for these casualties and consider this in the operational environment that will be present after nuclear detonation. And so the infrastructure damage, but also things like the fallout radius, it's going to necessitate evacuation. And uh, the emergency response to nuclear detonation will really have to have a continuum of care framed by two general phases. And this is from field or pre-hospital care all the way through to definitive care provided at the hospital or medical facility. And so considering this spectrum of where care may be provided, we need to make sure that any medical countermeasure is, that's developed is, considers this operational reality. So field care is facilitated by products that are ruggedized and easy to use. Um, and distribute in the field. Um, ideally, we can limit cold chain reliance and have products that are stable for over a longer period of time at ambient temperatures. And this is also facilitated by having products that are easy to administer and don't require specialized medical expertise to do so. But ideally, products will also be ones that are used in routine healthcare. So, the use of proven technologies, this is a preparedness goal in the BARDA strategy. And this is because if we can repurpose products that are already on the commercial market, or if we can fund the development of novel products that also have potential to have a commercial indication, um, it helps sustain availability of these products for use in public health emergencies. It also means that end users, medical providers, nurses, physicians, first responders, that they're familiar with these products and know how to use them ahead of going into a crisis scenario. So these considerations of the reality of the operational environment following a nuclear detonation and having products that are usable in this described scenario, this is a really important priority for the Red Nuke branch. So um, similar to what you just heard from Nelly, there is a real through line um, in a lot of the programs for the BARDA CBRN division. And this is that we really focused on treating the injury, not the threat. And for radiation injury and blast trauma, there's really no tangible threat agent that you can target. So but the Radney branch is really inherently an opportunity to respond to an element of the BARDA strategic plan, which is to develop multi-threat countermeasures and to have threat agnostic countermeasures. And we are very much focused on the injuries and the resulting pathophysiologies of what's happening downstream. So on one side, um, you have exposure to ionizing radiation. This results in cellular damage and apoptosis. The results in the pancytopenia that's characteristic of acute radiation syndrome, particularly low neutrophil and platelet counts that lead respectively to life-threatening infection and then hemorrhage. On the other side, blast forces um, cause a range of blast traumas, blunt, tra uh, blunt trauma, penetrating trauma, traumatic brain injury, and these can also result in life-threatening hemorrhage and systemic vascular injury. So, 
Of course, the body tries to respond to these injuries and kind of bring itself back to homeostasis, but that doesn't always work and protective mechanisms can really quickly transition to maladaptive responses um, that are characterized by some of the pathophysiologies noted here, like endotheliopathy, coagulopathy, inflammation, thromboinflammation, and these all occur as really complex and interrelated um, mechanisms that kind of play off each other and can worsen the situation. Um, and these can all lead to um, medical complications like infection or sepsis, ischemia, uh, multi-organ failure, and death. So again, really treating the injury, not the threat, and this focus on pathophysiology, and ideally shared pathophysiologies, which enables the development of threat agnostic countermeasures. This is really the foundational perspective of the Radnuke branch. And so with these injuries, pathophysiologies, and the operational environment in mind, the goal of the radiological nuclear countermeasure branch is to enhance radiological nuclear preparedness by improving the outcomes of individuals with radiation injury with blast trauma. And so our key areas of interest include, again, addressing those systemic effects of injury and blast trauma. This is things like the hematocrotic injuries and pathophysiologies. And also since hemorrhage is a life-threatening condition that's gonna result, you know, from either, can result from either radiation or blast trauma, uh, we also prioritize building blood system capacity. We also want to support the development of technologies that enable this understanding. And to reemphasize, so this focus on systemic effects um, is with the idea with understanding and targeting these shared pathophysiologies, it can help us address our branches um, priority threats of radiation and blast, but also potentially multiple threats, um, so that we have threat agnostic products in our armamentarium that are sustainable and can be used across the continuum of care. So some big, big achievements that we've had um, from collaboration with our industry partners and our government partners like NIAID, um, includes these drugs, and these are drugs that address the low neutrophil and platelet counts that are characteristic of acute radiation syndrome. Um, and these drugs that are listed here under the ones that are approved for radiation indication, these are products that are actually already approved for commercial indications like cancer. Um, but through repurposing and label expansion efforts, these are now FDA approved to treat patients that have been exposed to myelosuppressive doses of radiation. And importantly, there's the important element in the Barter Strategic Plan about protecting all members of our communities. And so these drugs are approved not only to treat adults, but they're also approved to treat radiation in pediatric patients. Oh. Okay. So as I mentioned earlier, life-threatening bleeding will be an important medical consequence of nuclear detonation. You know, whether this is from radiation-induced low platelet counts or from blast trauma. And so blood products will be a critical medical countermeasure um, to save lives following nuclear detonation. But the number of casualties that need blood products following nuclear detonation is going to greatly exceed and outpace the actual supply of blood products. And it has currently configured the US blood supply really can't surge appropriately in response to this to provide the product, blood products that we're gonna need. Um, but this blood supply sh uh, shortage is actually a day-to-day -day reality um, in routine care outside of any mass casualty incident. And actually early this year, the Red Cross declared a blood crisis. And we had shortages of blood supply and platelets that, as the worst we've seen in about a decade. So. This is a chronic issue that we want to address, um, but of course, this chronic issue will only be exacerbated following nuclear detonation or really any mass casualty incident where life-threatening hemorrhage occurs and transfusion is needed to save lives. So one way that the Bradnick branch is working to address this gap is by supporting the development of next generation blood products that are responsive to that operational environment that was described. So this includes a device to make spray dried plasma from Velico Medical. It includes a dried hemostatic agent uh, from Cellfire that's derived from platelets. Also includes a prothrombin peptide derivative from chrysalis. Our branch is also thinking about how to ensure the safety of the blood supply. So towards this end, we're supporting development of a pathogen reduction technology for red blood cells from Cirrus. 
But um, in addition to what we're currently supporting, we are really still interested in this next generation blood product space. We're also interested in new manufacturing platforms, uh, new platforms to make transfusion safer, uh, and optimization of transfusion, transfusion medicine. And to reemphasize, blood products and transfusion medicine will be very important to save lives following a nuclear detonation. So this product area is very important to the Radnik branch. Again, looking forward, understanding and treating the pathophysiologies that result from radiation and blast injury is a priority for the Radnuke branch. And we're really thinking about this in kind of the classic paradigm of understand, detect, and treat. Um, and the understand part is really critical. And the ideal outcome here is for us to understand the natural history of our priority threats of radiation and blast injury, but really to like connect this out to other threats as well so that we can identify shared pathophysiological pathways and develop shared biomarkers that we can translate into developing diagnostic, prognostic, and antitoping capabilities that work for both radiological threats as well as blast and potentially other threats. And of course, taking this forward to the next step, which is identification of new therapeutic targets to target these pathophysiologies of radiation and blast injury, but potentially other threats. Um, and then to go back to understanding, um, we're also looking to develop technologies that enable this understanding. And a key way we're doing this right now is through collaboration with industry and interagency partners. Where we're funding the development of some innovative technologies that were highlighted in the Barda Strategic Plan. This includes tissue chips and microphysiological systems. So of course, um, you've heard about this a lot. All of this work is done and will be done in collaboration with our interagency partners as well as through partners with end users and other important stakeholder communities, but really most importantly also through our current and future uh, partners. So if you think you have a product or technology that can help us answer yes to any of the questions that were posed at the start of this talk about helping us being prepared and improve our radiological and nuclear preparedness, I encourage you to one, Take a look at the BARD Abroad Agency Announcement, or BAA. The Radiological Nuclear Countermeasures Area of Interest is area interest number four. So take a close look at that. Take a look across the whole BAA. I think that's always helpful. And actually, also take a close look at the appendix where we have the technology readiness levels. I think if you take a read through that, you'll have a really good perspective on exactly how BARD also views your technology. And then second to that, reach out. There is a great panel earlier about engaging with BARDA, and you can do that through the Tech Watch. And this is just a really a great mechanism and resource. So you can have a discussion um, with BARDA, and we can hear more about your technology, and you can hear about our priorities and our perspectives. So when you're ready, following that, you can submit a white paper proposal. And real quick, it just came out, but we have a collaboration that was recently announced with the BARDA's Drive. It is called REPAIR that stands for Repurposing and Advancing Innovations Against Rad Nuke Threats. So here we're looking to repurpose uh, therapeutics for acute radiation syndrome. The requirements are that this is an approved product or at minimum in a phase two trial. And we're looking at specific areas of ARS like uh, cell death, vascular injury, coagulation, or ischemia. Um, so really the take home here is please engage early, engage often, and really peruse the BARDA BAA to understand what the priorities and requirements are so we can work together and develop um, products that can address the medical consequences, uh, consequences of uh, radiological nuclear threats. So real quick, thank you from me. And also thank you on behalf of our branch chief, Mary Homer. Uh, next up is our final speaker, uh, Vlado Antonik from the Burn Blast branch of CBRN. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Vlado Antonik, and I'm a biologist at BARDA. On behalf of our entire team at Burn and Blast program, I want to welcome you to BARDA Industry Day. Oh, oops. Uh. <laughs> All right. Uh, so uh, what is the uh, mission on Burn and Blast uh, program? Our mission is, is as BARD uh, as a whole, is to protect Americans against all sorts of uh, man-made and natural disasters. We are, our goal is to build a comprehensive national pre preparedness to uh, treat a range of burn and blast injuries that, uh, that can spend uh, 
from um, lacerations to cuts to uh, blunt trauma to TBI all the way to severe hemorrhage and uh, multi-organ failure and that. Uh, our strategy is to develop comprehensive, adoptable, and sustainable medical countermeasures that can be adopted into routine care and ensure that they have accessibility during mass casualty incident as well as uh, they have end user familiarity uh, during the mass casualty incident. Our focus is to invest in transformative and novel technologies that will have high impact on both uh, bottlenecks uh, in daily routine care as well as, as, well as uh, in, during mass casualty incidences. For example, we are looking for technologies that will enable early detection of injuries or enable uh, rapid and more accurate triage. Uh, oops, I keep going back. Uh, so how we do, uh, how we identify uh, targets across the care continuum. So we look at the two phases of care. We are looking at the initial, phase, initial care phase and the definitive care phase. The initial care phase takes place at the, at the point of injury in, within the first several hours after the injury. And the definitive care phase takes place in, in hospital settings and can last for days, weeks, months, sometimes even years. And as you can imagine, these two phases have different problems and uh, different solutions are needed to, to fill these uh, treatment gaps. For initial care phase, we are looking for technologies that will advance trauma life support. We are looking for technologies that will provide aid, that will detect injuries, that will enable rapid and accurate triage, that will enable better assessment of injury severity. While in the, in the hospital settings, we have a different set of problems. We are looking for technologies that will really enable medical care providers to manage these patients for the longer periods of time. So we are looking for technologies that will, that will improve pay, uh, treatment of the injuries and uh, technologies that will uh, improve recovery and uh, minimize the debilitating effects that some of these injuries can have for the long term. So uh, when you think about the, the, the realities of burn and trauma care in general, but particularly in mass casualty incidents, when we have uh, hundreds and we heard even thousands of people that are injured, we, we have to identify bottlenecks in care. One is the limited capacity to deliver care just by sheer number of patients, and the other one is the uh, bottlenecks that delay care. So in order to prepare for these uh, two possibilities, we are looking for technologies and solutions that can expand treatment capacity and that can increase the efficiency of some procedures. For example, we are looking, uh, ideally these technologies should uh, fill both of these gaps, but we are looking for technologies that will reduce resource needs either by leveraging uh, novel technologies such as artificial intelligence or, or advanced autograph sparing technologies. We are looking for technologies that will increase our capacity to deliver care on a large scale. We are looking for technologies that will shorten the hospital stay by developing products that will, um, that will improve uh, patient healing. We are looking for technologies uh, that will uh, expand time window for use that will in turn during the mass casualty incident enable us to better manage resources when, when some of the treatments are not as, as readily available as, as, as during the routine care. All right. So uh, our product uh, development philosophy uh, aligns well with Barda's strategic plan. We, we look for technologies that will uh, maintain our readiness posture where, where we can deploy these uh, medical countermeasures immediately. And we are looking for technologies uh, that, and we are also fostering the flexible partnership so that we can, we can have a nimble and responsive uh, program and, and program development efforts. Uh, we uh, in Burn and Blast uh, team, we, we, every hour, project takes a holistic approach. We uh, ensure that uh, our products are adopted as well as sustainable in healthcare market. And how we do that? Well, we uh, leverage Barda's experience in, in product development uh, and support our partners through technical aspects of product development effort and FDA approval. During this time, we continuously seek end user input. They are the ones who understand the unmet needs the first hand, and they are the ones who are going to be using these products in the future once when we develop them. Uh, this also ensures that these, our medical countermeasures are adopted and integrated into daily routine care and that they, they will be uh, available and that they will have end user familiarity during the mass casualty incident. And importantly, we are uh, looking to uh, support our partners in healthcare market space. We are performing modeling of economic impact that our products have on the daily routine care by demonstrating their value proposition, either by 
lowering the resource needs in the daily routine care or by lowering the cost of, cost of care. This ensures that our products are sustainable in healthcare marketplace and that they will be available when potential mass casualty incidents happen. As you heard this morning, uh, by the supported number of companies that, uh, that have, that uh, through FDA approval and uh, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, Argento Medical received their uh, 510K clearance for uh, silver loan dressing. This is by the 65th approval and uh, now silver loan dressing is uh, cleared to treat uh, three injuries, uh, thermal burns, sulfur master injuries, and now radiation, dermatitis and cutaneous radiation injuries. Okay, so, so let's take a look at the, the rest of the products in our portfolio. Uh, we, uh, in Burn and Blast uh, Medical Countermeasure Program, have two portfolios. One is a burn-oriented portfolio, and the other one is trauma-oriented portfolio. Uh, in Burn portfolio, we have five products. And uh, these, prod these products, some of them already received FDA approval. Some are well underway to, to receive theirs. But these products are strategically placed along the continuum of care, all the way from triage all the way to um, patient treatment and recovery. For example, with Spectral MD, we are developing DeepView, which is an imaging device. This device should uh, uh, detect burn depth and uh, assess healing potential using uh, artificial intelligence and uh, aid in our uh, capacity to, to, to triage patients in a mass casualty incident. Uh, Nexobrid is a non-surgical debridement, enzymatic non-surgical debridement uh, as opposed to surgical debridement in the operating room. In the mass casualty incident, we are expecting that this uh, product will reduce resource need uh, because the, the Nexobrid can be applied at the patient's bedside and they, they will not have to go undergo surgical debridement of the, of the necrotic tissue. This will also, in the mass casualty incident, increase our capacity to deliver care. Polynovo is developing Novosorb, which is a temporizing agent, and this uh, solution will expand window to treat burn injuries. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, during the mass casualty incident, uh, this, uh, this product will improve our resource management with other, other treatments are in, in short supply. Stratatech and Avita Medical developed uh, uh, treatments for the burn wounds, and uh, by improving the, the healing uh, capacity of the burns, uh, they will reduce morbidity and, and length of hospital stay, but in the same time, they will increase our capacity to deliver care during the mass casualty incident. In our trauma portfolio, we are focused uh, currently on, on early detection and triage of patients uh, uh, and injuries commonly seen in blast-related casualties. Uh, with Philips, we are developing Lumify, which is a point of care ultrasound device that can uh, that can assess abdominal uh, that can support the assessment of abdominal trauma. That is one of the commonly uh, seen injuries during the blast because the blast wave uh, causes the all the hollow organs to to disrupt. In uh, in this uh, this device will also increase our capacity to to deliver care. Uh, it will also enable us to detect injury in the lungs as, and uh, lung infections, including COVID-19. Uh, with Rivana Medical, we are, we are transforming the way we detect fractures. We are using ultrasound alternative to X-ray. And uh, by developing this uh, device, Acuro XV, we are hoping that uh, we will improve triage and reduce uh, emergency department crowding because uh, medical care providers will be able to fast track all the, all the patients with uh, low equity fractures and sprains. Uh, with Abbott, which is the, the, the newest addition to our portfolio, we are developing a biomarker-based uh, rapid blood test for detection and diagnosis of uh, traumatic brain injury. This test will be uh, developed for both uh, adult and pediatric populations. And in the, in the mass casualty incidents, we are expecting that uh, Abbott's test will uh, hopefully aid to, to resource, uh, resource management because we will not uh, have a need for, or there, there will be lower, it will lower the need for advanced imaging uh, technologies such as MRI or CT. 
So here are our priorities for the for the future. Uh, we are uh, these priorities uh, aligned, as you could uh, see, with the Barda's strategic plan. We are looking for intelligent point of care solutions. We are looking to develop uh, treatments and diagnostics. We are looking for technologies that will enable immediate care for uh, penetrating trauma and blast injuries. And we are looking for technologies that will advance trauma care integration in telemedicine. Uh, in some of these areas, we already have products such as. Uh, ultrasound, uh, such as Lumify or, or Acura XV, uh, we are looking for, uh, we have device or we have blood test for, for diagnostic of uh, TBI, but we are also looking to invest more in these spaces as well as, uh, as the other two. Oops. Uh, we identified the major bottleneck in uh, patient care near the point of injury and uh, immediately after the, the wounding. As you all know, in, in trauma care space, uh, preventable death due to a non-controlled hemorrhage is, is a known problem and, and a critical gap. Average time for person to uh, hemorrhage to death due to severe bleeding is measured in minutes. This is significantly shorter than the average time for the first responders to arrive at the scene. So this results in, a, in a approximately 40% of all trauma-related deaths worldwide being due to the bleeding. To fill this gap, we are looking for technologies that will address this bleeding immediately, that can be pre-positioned or that can be immediately accessible and that will expand the time to treat window so that the, end use, so that the first responders can arrive at the scene and, and start the treatments. All right, this looks different. <laughs> uh, so this is, a, if you can read, these are, these are four priorities of our uh, broad agency announcement. <laughs> uh, we, uh, so now I will have to read it. Uh, the, we have four specific areas of interest. We have general burn and blast injuries. We have traumatic head injuries. We have area of internal and external hemorrhage and uh, prevention of burned wound conversion. So um, as... Um, uh, so we, in, in general, burn and blast injuries, we are looking for uh, diagnostics and, and treatments, and we are looking for enabling diagnostic technologies that will really improve our, our immediate uh, care of patients. In traumatic head injuries, we are looking for initial interventions for TBI. We are looking for technologies that will uh, detect and uh, address brain hematomas. And we are looking for technologies that can non-invasively detect intracranial pressure. In internal and external hemorrhage, you, you could see, you could hear uh, just a few minutes ago, uh, this is a huge gap in both us and the Red Nook group share the same interest, but, but from the different angles. We are looking to address and pretty much stop the bleed uh, and, and uh, locate and control non-compressible and junctional bleeding. We are looking for endovascular technologies while they are developing solutions that uh, with their developing blood products. And finally, in the in the in the burn space, we are looking for solutions that can uh, that are non that are coming from non autologous sources and that can be used on a wide range of uh, burn and uh, burn depths and and really expand our time window to treat. Uh, we at Barda in, in our program. In particular, we, we can't do this by ourselves. So on, on behalf of our uh, brand chief, Dr. Ryan Iyer, as well as our entire team, I want to thank our partners that are coming from government, industry, trauma care societies, nonprofits. Without their participation and support, we would not be successful in our mission. Our mission is to, to, to jointly protect Americans against the national health security threats. For more information, uh, you can visit our website at uh, medicalcountermeasures.gov or contact Dr. Narayan Iyer at this email address. Thank you. All right, uh, we now have um, questions. The first one is for Nelly from the Chem Branch. Um, are these uh, symptoms, um, these are these symptoms, sorry. <laughs> are, are the, do the symptoms of the toxic drums overlap? So we don't have to repeat the question. I'm sorry. Um, are these symptoms uh, of the toxic drums, do they overlap? Working? Which, sorry. Great. 
So the five toxidromes are not overlapping. They're, um, so when I was talking about over, uh, overlapping, I was just mentioning, um, for example, vesicants can have multiple toxidromes. Okay. Um, are there classes of drugs that can work on more than one toxidrome? We hope so. <laughs> <laughs> So part of the repurposing um, isn't just for, you know, a shared clinical indication with a chemical indication. It, it's for also what you mentioned. So one drug for um, multiple symptoms, too. Okay. Uh, our next question is for Kimberly from Red Nuke. Um, can you provide a good example of a threat agnostic uh, product? Sure. I mean, I think the best example of a threat agnostic product we have right now is our blood products. Um, they can be used to treat trauma. We use platelets to address uh, the low platelet counts that are happening post-injury. And really, blood loss and platelets can be used in like a number of threat indications. I think one of the big priorities looking forward is vascular injury. Um, you know, whether this is radiation injury, the injury to the vascular endothelium, really we feel like we think um, underpins a lot of the pathophysiologies that we see. And so by targeting this kind of like uh, precipitating event or precipitating injury, we think we can hit a bunch of things where it's this radiation injury, all the pathophysiologies that happen downstream of trauma, but also things like endotheliopathy. This is present in viral hemorrhagic fevers. It's relevant to some chemical threats. So I would say uh, right now, it's the blood products in the future. Hopefully, some products that address endotheliopathy and coagulopathy. OK. Uh, and now we have a question for Vlado from Burn Glass Branch. Uh, could you repeat the four areas of the BAA and tell us which AOI uh, area of interest that is? Oh, uh, area of interest number six. Uh, sorry. Uh, within the BAA, Within the VAA, uh, our area of interest is the area number six. And within that area, we, we have six, one, six, two, six, three, and six, four. All right, uh, so that uh, was the questions we had. Should, uh, OK, so, so the six, one, uh, sorry, <laughs> so six, one is uh, general burn and blast injuries. Six, two is uh, traumatic head injuries. Six, three is external and internal hemorrhage. And six, four is uh, prevention of burn wound conversion. All right, Thank you. Uh, so that's the uh, end of the written questions we have. Uh, are there any questions around the room? Oh. Sorry. Uh, do we have any questions around the room? OK, this is not a question, but I'm just going to talk. So. <laughs> I think uh, one thing that's come up a lot is how much we coordinate and work together. Um, and a big coordination point, of course, is between us, the radiological nuclear countermeasures branch, and the burn blast branch. You heard that we are both focused on blast trauma. And I'm not entirely sure if it was clear from you know, the way we were talking about it, but I think if you have interest in understanding you know, exactly what the RADNU perspective on blast trauma is and what the burn blast perspective on that is, one, again, go take a look at the BARDA BAA. We're area of interest four. Burn Blast is area of interest six. There is some shared language that we worked on together to delineate that. And there is language in there as well. So if you think you have something that might go to Burn Blast or Rad Nuke that's uh, trauma, we will share this information and pull people um, into kind of any evaluations or tech watch discussions. But how that breaks down, I think um, the simplest way is what, and what we put in the BARDA BAA is that, again, Rad Nuke is really focused on the systemic effects of blast trauma, the things that happen downstream of that initial insult, while burn blast, uh, the way we put it, I think, is focused on addressing, detecting, addressing kind of that structural, initial structural uh, disruption to the integrity of the body. Um, anything to add, Lotto? Uh, no, I think that's, <laughs> that's great. Okay. I think we had uh, one question here. Um, let's see, this, uh... Uh, did BARDA ever purchase um, human cadaveric allograft uh, VMI material as proposed in the last two years 
to uh, graft full burn thickness burns. I think this one would be for uh, Vlado. Yes, we, we do. Okay. Uh, and there's another question. Um, I see that uh, repo chem efforts have ex uh, has expanded to include cyanide poisoning. Last year, this program was presented as focusing on atropine eye drops. Are there opportunities to further expand the aperture of this new effort? Yeah, so um, as I mentioned, there will be more details tomorrow at the repurposing breakout session. But yes, there, there is um, room to expand outside of the atropine eye drop. All right. Uh, that uh, is all the questions we have in the chat. Um, so we're going to wrap things up now. Thank you, everybody, for coming, and thank you to our speakers.